Okay, so it's 11 o'clock. Welcome to the OpenSUSE conference here in Nuremberg. And welcome to my talk today about the year of Linux on the desktop. And I guess it's uh, the last 20 years that it was uh, announced this is the year of Linux on the desktop. And now you ask who is the guy and how is he entitled to tell us about Linux on the desktop. So my name is Rainer König. I am a SUSE employee now since 10 months. And in a former life long ago, no, not so long ago, but until 2020, uh, for 17 years I was the person responsible for Linux on the desktop at Fujitsu in Germany. So my job was to empower Linux on the desktop to help people with desktop projects and to make customers happy that want to use Linux on the desktop. And it was quite a struggle. So let's see why we are always telling the people, yeah, this is the year of Linux on the desktop. And then, oh, no, not yet. Something is missing. So let's see. Hey, OK. First problem that we face is called market share. If you look at the big green bar, that's Windows. Desktop operating systems in 2021, we are more than 70% market share for Windows, which is no wonder because every manufacturer ships his uh, PCs with Windows pre-installed. Then we have uh, around 15% for Mac OS, and then between Linux and Chrome OS, there is a small competition around, I guess, 3 or 4% market share. And if you look at those numbers, the, the, the big thing is, uh, when I remember my previous job, uh, of course, according to those numbers, a firm invests more in putting Windows on the machines than on Linux. So in Fujitsu, we had, I guess, 17 software engineers that were uh, working on pre-installation of Windows because don't expect that uh, everything is easy peasy with Windows. It's also a struggle, but the customer doesn't see the struggle because when he buys the machine, it's pre-installed with Windows, everything is fine. And uh, everyone is happy, but the company has to pay a lot of investment to get the operating system on the machine. And the, the big thing, well, when, when, I, when people ask me, when would you say it's the year of Linux on the desktop? I would say, okay, let me go here to the next uh, discounter like MediaMarkt or Saturn, go in there and say, okay, I want to buy a machine, a computer with Linux pre-installed. And yeah, you will find out there's no way. I can buy at MediaMarkt. I had to look at the website uh, this week. I can buy, of course, machines with Windows 10 pre-installed, no problem. I can buy MacBooks and get Mac OS installed. I can even buy Chromebooks with Chrome OS, but I can't buy any Linux machine with pre-installed Linux, I can. There is a small, there are small channel partners of the, the big computer manufacturers that provide uh, Linux installations and Linux systems. There is one in my hometown that is called Tuxedo, and they, uh, there you can order a PC or a notebook with, I guess it's OpenSUSE pre-installed or Ubuntu pre-installed. I tried this. Two years ago, when I lost my job, I said I want a notebook for myself, but uh, they had really problems with delivery. They, they have a good, uh, how to say, uh, idea what they want to do, but they have a lousy logistics management. So anyway, uh, the big problem is when I say I want Linux pre-installed. Okay, let's ask around, which, which Linux do you want? We are here at the OpenSUSE conference, so people will say, of course, we want OpenSUSE. But then it turns out if I ship a machine with OpenSUSE pre-installed, you can bet that Linux magazine that is laid out downstairs will do a test and they say, yeah, 
that's great that they ship it with OpenSUSE pre-installed, but why don't they use Ubuntu? That's much more common than OpenSUSE or whatever. And the next guy will come and say, but I'm using Arc Linux. So why aren't you using Arc Linux for your pre-installation? And the third one comes, hey, I would like to have Fedora and so on. So we have a big variety of, of uh, Linux possibilities and nobody wants to take the decision and says, yeah, I want Linux uh, pre-installed, I use OpenSUSE, whatever. I can tell you what we did at Fujitsu because long time ago, I don't know if you heard about it, there was that uh, Microsoft tax that people had to pay because uh, we had the contract with Microsoft and that contract said uh, Fujitsu is not allowed to ship any PC without operating system because they said if somebody buys a PC without operating system, he will get the pirated copy of Windows and put it on it, and so we don't lose, uh, we, we lose that license fee, and so Fujitsu is not allowed to ship uh, machines without operating system. But there were customers that said, okay, I want this machine without operating system because I don't want Windows and I don't want to pay for the Windows license. So... What we did in that time was we were very creative and we said, okay, uh, Microsoft asked us not to ship without operating system. So we burned a lot of OpenSUSE Leap or Tumbleweed CDs depending on the machine. And when the customer ordered the machine without operating system, we just dropped that CD in and said now it's with operating system even if it doesn't use it whatever, we don't pay for it and we pay no license fees to Microsoft and we fulfill our contract. But uh, licensing is also a big problem when it comes to, to pre-installing Linux. I remember we had discussions pre-installing Linux and the, the big problem was the GPL because Fujitsu once got sued uh, by Harald Welte is the name, I guess, for GPL violations because they shipped a, a cheap uh, wireless router that had Linux installed, but they didn't provide the sources. So they had to pay a fine for that. And then they got very much concerned about uh, GPL licensing. So when I said I want to ship a machine with Linux pre-installed, then they said, yeah, but then we have to provide the sources if somebody asks. So uh, we had a, a big struggle even when we just wanted to ship a software that runs on Linux. We had a department in, in the legal section that was really a pain in the ass, so to say, that forced us to uh, find out the licenses of all libraries and components and runtime systems and so on. Uh, we said we just want to develop software. We don't want to do license stuff. But anyway, that's, that's the, the real world problem. So you see there is the hurdle and there is tax that doesn't jump over that market share hurdle at the moment. But I have to say we had a market share, a very big market share in the workstation sector. It's not the, the office desktop, but workstations, they had a market share of around 50% that were running on Linux. So it's a bit uh, out of uh, sync, this, this statistics. If you look at the segments of desktop uh, workstation, they have appliances for, for Linux. So the next hurdle that we have, ah, innovation cycles, innovation, change ahead. You know, we were a hardware manufacturer. We, our job was to, to produce new hardware, and Intel was supporting us by producing new chipsets every year. Every year you get an announcement, there's a new chipset, yeah, great. We build a new mainboard, and at the end it comes out, yeah, okay, uh, mainboard is here, but uh, the distribution kernels are not ready for that hardware. There's even a bit more problem with change ahead because we had um, the, the hardware part was one, but the other one was software. There were, I mean, uh, if you run Linux, you are not running Linux in a empty space. You are running Linux in an environment. You want to do something with it. And I remember one incident we had that I had to go to England, because in England there was a 
system for car inspection at the garage. So in Germany, you know, we have the TÜV, the, the Technical Überwachungsverein, that has to do uh, inspection of your car every two years. And they had to say a similar thing in England. And they were really, how to say, highly sophisticated. They said, yeah, we, we deliver PCs to the garage. They get the connection to a central server and they can download checklists. And uh, the mechanic in the garage can just go through this checklist and cross off the items and put in the, the values of the measurements. And then the car gets certified again and everything is fine. And the garage, of course, didn't care what machine they have. This, for them, they just needed some machine that they say, I can do my checklist. I don't care if this is a tablet or a desktop PC or whatever. And the company that was providing the checklist software, they have certified that software for SUSE Linux 10. That was long ago. And then I got a call from uh, the, the salesperson in England and said, yeah, look, we have a problem here with the SUSE Linux 10 on your machine. And I said, yeah, that's no problem. I mean, that's, that's no wonder. Uh, you have a SUSE Linux kernel from, let's say, that was in 2008. But I said, you have a kernel that is from 2004. And now you get a hardware that is from 2008. What do you expect the kernel to do? It doesn't know about the components that we have now in the hardware. So you have to update. And they said, uh, what's the, the fuss with it? I mean, at this time, I guess it was 11.3 out or whatever. I said, just update, open SUSE, and problem gone. Should work. And they said, no, it doesn't work. And then uh, it turned out, yeah, it, it was really the problem that they were forced by their software provider that they should run it on SUSE 10. I, I was even tweaking the kernel for them and said, okay, let me put in the, the drivers that you need. Uh, of course, you then have a new kernel. You don't have an original SUSE 10 kernel. And they said, no, that's not what we want. And then they found a hardware vendor that was able to ship old computer hardware with old chipsets. And they said, yeah, okay, then we buy, buy with this vendor and we don't buy from you because you only have the newest systems and here we can buy systems that work. And they said, okay, but sooner or later you have to pay the price because sooner or later even your vendor that can now ship old systems will run out of stock and then you are facing the same problem again. So we are not running in a empty space we are running in an environment that is constantly progressing so everyone should take care of this progress everyone should look how is hardware developing how is software de developing for example here change ahead i'm using my system at home of course with linux i have linux on the desktop for at least 20 years now uh, and i'm using mail and i'm using contacts from Google because I have all my contacts on my phone and it's nice that I can import them in evolution. At least it was nice until last summer. And then it started to nudge me. I said, look, uh, evolution, the API will change and uh, you can't use that API from December 15 on, so you should switch. I said, okay. Let me see. And then I had a look around and I found out, yeah, there is a new API for Google Contacts. And that is already upstream in evolution. But it didn't make the way down to OpenSUSE Leap at the moment. So my solution was, okay, I have a Raspberry Pi at home that runs uh, Nextcloud. So I moved the contacts to Nextcloud and now I have access to my contacts as well. But people will get crazy with that because they say, okay, I want to, to use my contacts. I don't want to find out which software do I have to install and which uh, software I have to compile myself because uh, upstream it is there, but it's not in the distribution. So this, this makes uh, it very difficult for people to use the things. And the third thing is we have uh, also... I mean, uh, you know, in Windows, they had the DLL hell when every program needs its own DLL. In Linux, we have dependency hell. And in this case, I mean, we have uh, 
good software. I remember some 10 years ago I did a speech on my local uh, Linux user group about video processing. And this was the time when, when you were putting videos on um, DVDs. And there was a great program called QDVD Alpha. That worked really nice. But that was based on QT3, I guess. So if I would like to run this program today, I still can get the sources, but I doubt that I can compile them without any adjustment because we are now at QT5 or whatever. So uh, the thing is we need lifecycle management, whatever. Next hurdle is unwillingness to pay for it. I mean, I can tell you, I have talked to so many high managers that said, yeah, Linux is open source, open source is free. And they were thinking of free beer. They were not thinking of free to use and free to modify or whatever, what the GPL tells us, it's just a, that has to, to cost practically nothing. And it's not small firms. I was at the, I remember that incident, it's also long ago, that was the age of uh, SUSE Linux Professional 9.3. So really long ago, there was a car manufacturer in Stuttgart, Sindelfingen, you know, the one with the star, that had a problem with our workstations because we had, it was, it was at the brink of 32 to 64 bit transition. And uh, we had a problem that the machine was just freezing. And of course, uh, engineer in automobile development doesn't want the workstation to freeze, he wants to do his job. So they said, you have to come and see what's wrong with that machine. And I said, okay, what was the environment? It turned out, yeah, they had our hardware, they had SUSE Linux 9.3, and they had, um, what was it, another company involved that had uh, offered some, some management libraries. And I said, okay, SUSE 9.3 with our workstation works perfectly. And they said, yeah, but our software with other workstations also works perfectly, so where is the problem? And we went there twice. We went once. I was really, that was, that was one of the most horrible uh, support incidents I ever had because we, we were shown the machine and said, you have to make this run, we go for lunch. I didn't ask, do you want to have lunch as well or whatever, this is your job, you have to fix this. Uh, we were there, no, no way to fix it. We, we were able to see that the problem occurs, but nobody had an idea why. Then we did another attempt, we said, okay, let's ask SUSE for help. At least it's SUSE running, and it was, I guess, Holger Dyroff was the, the, the CEO at this time. We said, we, we would like to have a SUSE engineer on site. We said, no, come on, this one is using SUSE, the, the open source, the, the public thing where it doesn't pay for it, so why shall we provide support? If we use a SLES, yes, we will be happy to come and help you, but if he provides uh, no license fees, why shall we provide software support? So we were there, we went the second time with uh, people from hardware development and hardware analyzers, we were seeing that the machine is freezing and no way to fix it. The, the final fix we found out, uh, uh, I guess four weeks later, when some engineer from hardware development was looking at the erratas for the AMD Opteron CPU that was used there and said, oh, that looks like the problem we have at Daimler. And it turned out it was the problem. And the pro this time we had the uh, mainboards from Gigabyte, and Gigabyte already knew about the problem and fixed it in their BIOS, but not in the BIOS they provided for us. So it was really a big fuss, but it's not about only Daimler, it's also the other big car manufacturer well known in Lower, uh, lower, Se yeah, lower Saxony, Wolfsburg. You know who I'm talking about. They also had workstations, and they had problems with uh, the Linux distribution, they were running on it and they used scientific Linux because scientific Linux is 100% compatible with Red Hat. Why shall I pay for Red Hat support if I can get the scientific Linux for free? And they had lots of problems and they were begging Red Hat to help them and Red Hat was talking to us and said, what shall we do with them? They don't want to pay license fees, but they want support. 
I mean, this is, this is really a problem. It's getting better now because uh, maybe because also of, of Microsoft's uh, direction to a subscription model, so there is not much difference between subscribing to SUSE uh, Enterprise or this for, uh, subscribing to Office 365, but anyway. So next problem is personal or vendor login. I know so many people that said, ah, I can't use LibreOffice, that's so complicated. I can only use Office 365 or Microsoft <coughs> Word or Excel or whatever. And okay, I have to confess, if you see those slides, I, I made the slides with a different template at the beginning of May. And last week a mail arrived from Douglas, hey, there is a new template, it would be nice if you could use that for your slides. I said, okay, it can't be so difficult, let me see. And you know, it was not five minutes to replace the template and maybe change some colors, it was two hours. And I had practically to learn about all LibreOffice templates and, and how to apply them and what's important, what's not so important, and so on. So it's, it's not that I blame it to the people. I mean, I'm, I'm in the mindset if there is some challenge that I have to learn something, okay, welcome, I will do this, no problem. But there are really small, narrow-minded people that say, no, nah, no way. I don't want to use LibreOffice. I don't want to use whatever. And uh, there is a great author I can recommend you that's called Tom DeMarco. And long ago, he wrote a book uh, called PeopleWare that's about software development. And he said that famous quote, he said, people don't like change. They really, really do not like change. And that's what we envision here. They, whenever you come with some new solution, it must be very much better for the people so that they accept it. If it's just I replace Microsoft Office with LibreOffice, everybody tells you, and what's the fuss about it? I was happy with Microsoft Office, why well, shall I use LibreOffice now? What, what is the, the big gain that I have? If I, if I have no pain with the one solution, where shall I change to another one? And uh, I mean, I remember when I started at SUSE, it was so funny, just, just for comparison. I started and we were using Rocket Chat. And then there came the announcement in September, we will switch to Slack. And there was a big discussion, why shall we switch to Slack? What is the uh, advantage of Slack over Rocket Chat? And so on. It's exactly that mindset that it says, okay, I, I really don't like change. It, we can envision it everywhere. The other thing, the free building blocks, you see that was for, uh, as I said before, software is not running in an empty space. They want to do things. And uh, people that were using Microsoft products for years now, they have implemented their own automation solutions, whatever, maybe with Visual Basic for applications. I remember... Uh, Linux Tag 2006 or 2007 in Karlsruhe, there was a speech from Florian Schiesel that was the main engineer for the Munich project for Linux to, to, to switch the whole municipality to Linux. And he said, our biggest problem is that a lot of departments have developed their own solutions with Excel and whatever. And if I tell them now you have to move to Linux, they say none of this will work, so we don't want to do this. This, this is the big hurdle that we face, that we can't provide the, the solutions that people want. We, we, we provide practically a 125 blade pocket knife, Swiss Army model extended, but uh, it's not what the people want to use. So. What can we do? No, this was the wrong direction. What can we do to get better, to, to bring people to the desktop? One thing is we should provide good manuals, good training. And uh, my, my wish, personally, my wish after long experience with learning new software like, let's say, OpenQA, whatever, uh, let the people let the, the users write the documentation if possible. 
don't let uh, the developers write the documentation because we, as a developer, we have a big bias. We know what our baby does and we know how it works and we uh, practically find we know every shortcut and so on. But the usual user doesn't know this. And the usual user wants to, to have a, a moderate learning curve. He doesn't want to jump up to, to high level learning and then learn a few tricks. He, he really needs to somebody that takes him by the hand and says, look, this is how it's going. And you should also provide tutorials. And, and if I say tutorials, you should provide tutorials that work. So I would like to have a website that says you do this and I can reproduce it on my machine and I can say, okay, now I understood it. I remember with horror in my job, I had to learn about embedded Linux. There was open embedded, mainly uh, developed by people from Texas Instruments and uh, it was great, no way, but uh, the documentation, the tutorials, you start and after five minutes you crash somewhere and you have no idea why you crash. And uh, I remember those, this was so famous, I had a conference call with them because then we switched to Yocto project, it's uh, also embedded software developed by Intel and there was much more and much better documentation. And I asked the people from Texas Instruments, so can you tell me why aren't you providing similar documentation for Open Embedded? That would be really nice. And they told me, look, we are here and we are paid for development, for not for writing documentation. So that, that's our big problem. Even now with, with Agile, I see it in, in, in SUSE as well. We develop some new uh, things and the documentation is, is later. We're doing it agile, the agile way, but uh, it doesn't mean that everybody understands what you have there. And there's a, a big saying that says, a uh, fool with a tool is still a fool. So try to make it not being a fool. Try to show him how to use this tool. So the next one, let me see what, what can, ah, here. Oh yeah, what can distributors do? As a distributor, I would say, uh, have an eye, have a radar. Look what's, what's the environment is doing. Look what software, what, what hardware challenges are on the road to the future. I mean, SUSE, I, I know they have a lot of uh, technical events with Intel, with Lenovo, with whatever, so that they are uh, in sync with the development. And of course, sleep is profiting from that because Leap uses the same kernel as less. So this is what, what we do, but also uh, uh, distributors that package things. Just remember that uh, thing with the Google Contacts API. I mean, this, this was uh, invalid now in December. Now we have June. Leap 15.4 will be gold or is gold. Meanwhile, it will be released now. And uh, I don't know if we will be able to access Google Contacts as well or if we have to tweak our distribution again. So, yeah, I guess we are pretty well on time. Thank you for the interest. Hope you enjoyed it. If you have additional questions, I'm here to ask, uh, to answer. <laughs> Tell me. Yeah, I know. Uh, thanks for the interesting talk. Just one interesting to me uh, that uh, Subutio has a, a, a department that is for Linux in the desktop. Yeah. Um, that is maybe for the background. Uh, for me personally, the view of doing on the desktop was not for me too useful. Yeah. Yeah, that's the, the big deal.
Yep. Yeah, I understand. Yeah, I can tell you when when I was uh, becoming the guy for Linux, I was previous. I was in Windows testing, and uh, Microsoft was always uh, giving incentives that uh, the companies should do so that they save license costs because they said if you can fulfill this requirement, you will get the license. Let's say for one dollar less, and if you ship a million systems in a year, that's a million dollars. So. Of course, they go for it. But I remember that the last one that they did was Microsoft was saying, okay, our ne next requirement is you press the power button and 30 seconds later, I want to see the start button of Windows, no matter what. That was the requirement. And uh, it was, a, for my understanding, it was a complete stupid requirement because I don't care if I see the start button because when I see it and I press it and then a menu pops up and then the menu falls apart because some background process is uh, killing it, uh, it's nice that I can see the start button, I can't use it. But my company was really putting engineers on, we have to fulfill this requirement. They were tweaking the BIOS that it was fast as possible and everything was uh, practically priority two and priority one was okay we have to see the start button in 30 seconds and I said that, that can't be. I want to do a really meaningful and, and reasonable job and I don't want to jump after the uh, carrot that Microsoft holds in my face and say here bite this is for you. I want to have, uh, we, we had really other problems with the chipsets that need to be addressed and nobody was looking at it because everybody was, oh, 30 seconds, that's important because there we save money. But and then that was in, in 2003, they said, yeah, there are many, uh, how to say, projects that want Linux. Uh, we need somebody with Linux experience. I said, okay, I'm doing Linux at home for at least five years now, so I can do. And I got the job and I was there until the very end of Fujitsu in Germany. And uh, what's uh, called pre-installation, I mean, I can tell you there is, there is a way that you can ship machines with Linux. I remember we had a project from a French uh, channel partner that was every year coming and said, I want to buy the cheapest model of consumer notebooks. And this has to run with Ubuntu. And we had to, I had to provide a test plan and a test report for how this machine performs with Ubuntu. And then they created a preload, a disk image for the hard disk and said, this one I want to ship on 10,000, 20,000 notebooks. And I mean, that the factory was, was able to, it uh, was practically the daily work of the factory that you have a master hard disk and you replicate it for every machine. And then they shipped the machine with that hard disk image and that went to Ethiopia in Africa and was delivered to schools. So that was a great success. We were even on the French TV with this. But that was because there was a clear requirement. We want this pre-installed image from Ubuntu so nobody had to care about license uh, management because uh, legal said, okay, the customer says license is fine, so we believe him and we just replicate. And But if you would need to, to decide on a distribution, you are running into the troubles that there are too many distributions around and too many desktops and too many whatever. I mean, before there was that talk of Simon downstairs about enlightenment themes and then we have I'm using XFCE, the other one is using KDE and the next one is using GNOME. What am I pre-installing? That's the big deal. Okay, any other questions? Oliver? Whoa, well, what can I do? I'm 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 still struggling with OpenQA, but anyway, I, I try my best. I mean, I'm, my my job, I think I I want to promote 
open source wherever I can. I am going to my, my local Linux events in, in Augsburg and whatever and tell the people, look, it's not that difficult to run Linux on your machine tomorrow morning. If you are an early starter, I have a talk about hardware compatibility. Because many people say, I'm, I'm, I would like to try Linux, but I don't know if it runs on my machine because there is Windows that is running, I know it, and Linux, I'm, I'm afraid. And you don't need to be afraid. I can tell you tomorrow that's uh, all easy, but uh, I mean, uh, if we are honest, in the beginning of the battle between Microsoft and Linux, there was a lot of thought, uh, that fear, uncertainty, doubt that was spread by Microsoft. The people were, oh, Linux will be cryptic, Linux will be uh, difficult. I, I remember I was once with the notebook in, in holidays with my friends of my wife in Italy and I booted Linux and it was no uh, splash screen, it was just text messages scrolling and they said, oh, is this running with DOS? So they, they had no idea and that's the thing we, we should promote, we should tell them, okay, there is always uh, an open source alternative. It's uh, whatever, I mean, uh, I don't want to to use uh, proprietary software. I'm sometimes forced to do this because I'm president of a shooting club and member management is done by a pro program that is ruled by the um, federation that we have. So we have no choice then to use that, but I'm not happy with that. So. Yeah, bring your own device. I mean, I, I, I remember when, when I was at Fujitsu that the fun thing was uh, we had a remote managed Windows desktop that every employee should use. And I said, look, guys, I'm the one responsible for Linux. I will be in contact with customers and I don't want to show a customer a Windows screen when I'm working, he has to see that Linux is possible. So I was installing my own Linux system. I was always struggling with the exchange server and, and connectivity to the calendar. But anyway, I said, that's, that's my way to promote it. Because I can't uh, advocate for, for a Linux and then use Windows. That, that would be completely a contradiction in terms. So, any other questions? If you have questions, I will be around all the day. And I can tell you some other jokes from support uh, incidents, but they would uh, fill the, the, the speech here too much. So, thank you and have a nice day for the rest of the day. Thank you.